My name is Rebecca Schunk. I'm a physician, and I've killed someone. Well, at least it feels that way to me. Haven't you? You remember the patient, right? The one in the emergency department? That one in the intensive care unit? What about that clinic patient? I imagine many of us in this room have that story that haunts us. For me, I vividly remember it. I keep telling myself it was going to happen anyway. Clearly, my attempts to forget have not worked. Here I am, 25 years later, talking about the day she died. Yes, she died. Mrs. M was a robust and strong woman. She was 83 years old and from Dundalk, a steel town on the outskirts of Baltimore. At one time, 50,000 steel workers lived in that town. Mrs. M was the wife of one of those steel workers, and she, like all people in Dundalk, lived in one of those form stone row houses right out of a John Waters movie, where everyone calls everyone else hun. She was loved and meticulously cared for by her grand niece, but years of chain smoking and hypertension had taken its toll. When she arrived in that emergency department, she was so sick she went straight to the cardiac care unit where I was a third year resident taking overnight call. She was very short of breath, but I took her history and learned that she had a history of mitral valve regurgitation and systolic heart failure. And this new onset arrhythmia had taken her to the edge of a cliff. We carefully diuresed her we started her on antiarrhythmic medications, and we really addressed all of her health care needs. So what was my fatal error? Did I give her the wrong medication? Did I collapse her lung during a thoracentesis? Mine was a simple error, the same simple error that occurs every day in health care settings around the world. It was a communication error, a failure to do a check back. What is a check back, you ask? Let's get started at the top of this complicated algorithm. I'm just teasing. <laughs> Had to lighten the mood there a little bit. A check back is incredibly simple. So simple, in fact, that your teenage neighbor who works at In-N-Out Burger, he does it every day on his shift. Your order? Yes, yes. I would like a double meat protein style with ketchup and mustard instead of the pe special sauce. Hmm, do I want onions? Do I want onions? You know, actually, I'm just really hungry. I'd like a double double animal style with french fries and a Diet Coke, please. Okay, great. Let me make sure I got that right. You want a double double protein and animal style with a Diet Coke and french fries. No, no, that was the first order. I, I changed my mind, remember? I want a double double animal style with french fries and a Diet Coke. Okay, I got it. Double double animal style, Diet Coke, french fries. That's correct. Thank you. A check back is just that simple. In the case of Mrs. M, I, this cardiac care unit nurse just simply did not understand my instructions, and I failed to do a check back. As a result, we had started the flecainide, we did not monitor the EKG changes, and Mrs. M had a fatal arrhythmia and died. Now, you could say that she should have known about the problems, and you could say she should have at least known when to call the doctor. You could say the pharmacist should have been aware, but that's not the point. The point is, I had anticipated the problem, as had my attending. And if I had communicated clearly, and if checkbacks were a routine part of clinical care, Mrs. M might still be here today. Not today, 25 years later, but still be alive many years or months long longer than she actually was. In fact, if I am honest, I would say that this error, error is just one of many to which I've been a part. Think about it. How many of you in this room have not been a part of a near miss or a fatal error? 
The fact is, we in this room are not alone. As we all know from the 1999 Institute of Medicine report to Air is Human, our failures do not result from a lack of competence or recklessness, but simply stem from the fact that we are all human and we all make mistakes. It is now clearly acknowledged that lapses in communication and teamwork account for more than 75% of all medical errors and injuries. I'm here today to say we need to embrace, not flee from our errors and mistakes. We need to embrace clear communication and commit to learning some basic communication skills that we can repeat routinely so that we can avoid situations like happened with Mrs. M. Some water. <clears throat> My adventure into teamwork and collaboration began in 2010 when the VA implemented the patient-centered medical home nationwide. At the VA, we call it PACT for patient-aligned care teams. And I remember the first day I was told that I was going to spend two and a half days learning how to work in a team. I think I thought, I'm very sure I said, I'm a good team player. Aren't we already doing that? Didn't I learn that in medical school? Well, it turns out that the patient-centered medical home is much more than just, quote, being a good team player. It's about learning how to share the work. And I'm not talking about a physician telling a nurse or a Lelvian or a clerk, you need to do that, you need to do that. It's about learning how to have a mutual understanding of the work. So what we all as a team know what the work is. And not only a mutual understanding, but a mutual understanding of the work and who would be best on the team to do that work. It's about learning to be a backup for each other. Imagine if that had happened for Mrs. M. When the San Francisco VA implemented the patient center medical home, there was a flurry of activity. We rapidly hired more than 20 registered nurses, licensed vocational nurses, clerical associates. We embedded, our, we embedded psychologists and pharmacists and social workers right into the clinical teams. Many of you may not know, but the VA central office was so embedded in this that the medical centers were actually given, their reimbursement was linked to the implementation of huddles. And so very, I mean, like week one, we were going to have a huddle. And I remember, without any instruction beforehand, I remember the nurse said, today we're going to huddle. And we all got in the room, and, and I said, okay, we're going to huddle. Huddle, what's a huddle? I mean, literally those words came out of my mouth, which is really funny because now I've, I consider myself a huddle expert. But those were, those were really the very first days. I, you know, had, despite the fact that I had very little knowledge initially, I was an early adopter. I could see how amazing it could be if I had a team to help me take care of this clinical workload of taking care of these complicated veterans. So I read voraciously on the topic, and unfortunately my enthusiasm failed miserably at the very beginning. Reality set in. It turned out those huddles were very perfunctory, with very little work that got done. My peers and I found you know, it was actually easier just to do the work yourself than figure out how to share it with someone else. It turned out that we were having difficulty communicating with each other. That's where Team Steps stepped in. Team Steps is an evidence-based teamwork training program for healthcare workers. It's based in aviation safety, and it was designed actually by the AHRQ and the Department of Defense. And it's basically some communication school tools and strategies that you can use in your day-to-day -day work in healthcare. Tools like we talked about a few minutes ago, a check back, but other things that maybe you're already using but not regularly enough, like IPASS and ISBAR. There are also other strategies like briefs. And many of you, maybe people who are just right out of residency, use these, I know we do at the VA, for um, code teams, the initiation of new code teams every, every uh, month. We talked about huddles, but also debriefs. So debriefing a complicated situation, maybe something didn't go so well, so an opportunity for improvement. But these are some concepts, tools 
and, and strategies actually to work better in teams. We actually sent two teams, about 20 people, including licensed vocational nurses and registered nurses, actually to get training at different sites across the country. It's free, by the way, um, except for the travel. And we learned how some of these communication skills and how we could apply them to our work um, at the VA. At the same time the VA nationwide was implementing the medical home, they actually provided funding for centers of excellence in primary care education. UCSF and the San Francisco VA partnered to develop a proposal. We had leadership from the School of Medicine, the School of Nursing. We had leaders in residency education and nurse practitioner education. We had leaders from the clinics in San Francisco VA. We had specialists in communication and, and teamwork. We even had specialists in medical education and workplace learning. We all together contributed lots of time and energy and created a very strong proposal and were awarded one of five centers of excellence in primary care education, which we call EDPAC, standing for Education on Patient Aligned Care Teams. We were awarded a million dollars a year um, to do this work for five years, which was really one of the largest amount, uh, sums of money that's been given for educational intervention. And it was actually very novel in that it included interprofessional trainees. The mission of our center is to teach interprofessional trainees how to deliver patient-centered team-based care. So how did we do that? Well, we partnered UCSF internal medicine residents and UCSF nurse practitioner students. We embedded them with clinical care teams. This is a picture of, of one of our huddles. The, some of these trainees, especially the residents, are with these clinical teams up to three years. We spend a lot of time having those teams form. We do retreats every year, a half-day retreat, where we actually are fortunate enough that the UCSF residents who are inpatient actually come and join their teams to really form these strong bonds um, with their teams so they can communicate better. This is a, an example of one of our huddles, which I think is kind of the essence of what um, our center is about. This is a huddle that happens every morning. The trainees are in clinic. Um, and I'm going to tell you exactly how the huddle actually goes. Here is a nurse practitioner student. She's actually at the computer. The, um, the resident, the RN, the clerk, and the LVN. And they actually begin the morning with a check-in. That's team bonding. I, I, when I started doing this, I didn't check-in. Why do we need a check-in? Check-in's really important, actually, because it helps bond the team. And the residents have really gotten into it, as a matter of fact. Um, the latest one in my huddle is um, one of our residents, UCSF residents, has decided we need to have a joke of the day, and so it rotates about what, who, who's in charge of the joke of the day. But there's a, a bonding opportunity at the very beginning of these huddles. But then the clinical work gets done. The LVN here actually reviews the agendas of the patients of the day. So she's made pre-visit phone calls for all of our trainee patients, and she's giving the agendas. Mr. Jones wants his med refill, that sort of thing. Um, then the RN has actually reviewed the patients for the next week. She scrubbed the charts, we call it. She's looked to see what the trainees have asked to have happen at the next visit. She's formulated a plan, looked at vaccines, decided what needs to be done, presents that to the trainees, the nurse practitioner student and the resident, and they add their own piece. Oh, actually, I'd also like to get medical records. We then finish that by negotiating um, the high-risk patients, this is very important because we have a lot of residents who are running off to the ICU, so we might be talking about a patient who's um, the, res the resident partner that's in the ICU. Their patient has arrived. How are we going to manage that patient? Maybe this resident is actually going to rotate to the ICU, and how are we going to manage her patients while they're gone? So these are some complicated um, patients that we're dealing with during that time. So that's really what happens in the huddle. But from a learning perspective, from a center of excellence perspective, it is much more than just the clinical care. What I, who I didn't tell you who is in this huddle, um, and this picture is actually the person taking the picture, which was me. Um, I'm the huddle coach of this, this, um, this actual huddle. Um, so every one of our huddles has a huddle coach. Um, huddle coaches are either nurse practitioner faculty or medical faculty, medicine faculty, who are preceptors of the day. And these coaches are there certainly as a systems expert, yes, how you order a pain, this is how you order a pain consult, this is how you get home care. But more importantly, they are a communication expert. They actually role model communication tools. They actually point out information, good, good use of tools. So for example, yesterday one of our great residents had a long list of labs that needed to be ordered. 
Um, and she said, Leonidas, these are the labs that I need ordered for my patients next week. I just want to confirm, you're going to order, am I going to order these or are you going to order these for me? And the nurse took the piece of paper and said, I am going to order these for you. Just, just that simple bit of communication that it was clarity who was going to do the work. That was just simply about labs, but it could also have been about who is going to monitor the EKG, who's going to check, you know, the vent settings, something, you know, critical. So we, we, when that happened, I said, time out. That was a very good check back. I loved how we knew exactly what was happening with, with, um, with what was happening with the labs. So we, as, a fat, as a coach of the huddle, we actually spend a lot of time, you know, giving feedback, asking the silly questions. We just heard that Mr. Jones needs to go to rheumatology. He, that's the one thing that has to happen for him, and he's missed his appointment three times. We talked about how one, somebody on the team was going to call him and remind him I was not sure who was going to do that. Who on the team is actually going to do that? So something very simple as reminding trainees they need to complete the thought. People, and not just trainees, actually. We're coaching also, also the staff to do this as well. So that's, that's really the communication coach piece. I want to say that we have spent a lot of time doing this. We've been very successful. So successful, in fact, um, that we've become an integral part of the clinic. We've really embedded ourselves in the VA clinic. And many times we were, um, actually have become now, but not just the teachers or the trainees, but the teachers of, teachers of the staff. And now the staff have evolved, and now they're the teachers of all of us, right? So now we have LVN saying, don't worry, I will teach them how to huddle. We don't need to do a huddle in service. You know, we'll just, we'll do it real time. I, 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 we got, I got this, said our LVN, you know, just last month. Um, so we have become an integral part of the clinic, and as such, our grant is ending in, in 2015, um, in September 2015, and we have actually been funded by our medical center to continue the efforts because it's so critically important. So um, they've really um, invested in that. Um, I wanted to say that we are not the only folks doing these sorts of things. You know, there are a lot of people, maybe a lot of you here, and I see some important people here doing this, um, really thinking about um, interprofessional education in other ways. So backing it up, before even people become a resident or, um, or a nurse practitioner student, um, there, we're, this is actually really earlier on. So one of the things that we're doing, um, I'm a part of an interprofessional education work group, which are members from the School of Nursing, the School of Pharmacy, um, the School of Dentistry. We're getting together and we're talking about how we can teach early learners in our schools to start doing some of this interprofessional communication and collaboration. And one of our efforts is actually this online Coursera course. You can go to Coursera today and sign up for it. It's actually happening right now. We spent the last year, a lot of us, um, here maybe even in this room, um, designing this um, called Collaboration and Communication in Healthcare, um, Interprofessional Practice. Um, we have 4,500 people involved in learning about um, interprofessional communication and collaboration. So it's very exciting. So these are some of the unique opportunities and really the wave of the future trying to get more and more interprofessional trainees working together early on instead of these silos. There's also a very interesting project that I wanted to make you aware of um, in pediatrics actually. There was just an NIH study on communication tools in pediatrics. They actually studied the mnemonic iPass that I mentioned earlier and they've actually found some very positive results that are going to be published very shortly. So look for that. I'm sure we'll see that on the UCSF page. Let's see here. I want to end in a minute or two by saying, you know, I think, it, I think you've heard me say that I think it's critically important that we teach communication tools and strategies and how to work in teams to save patients, right? To improve medical care, to improve patient safety. But I would say there's even another reason to do it. I think you're looking at them right there. <laughs> um, I imagine many of you are a lot like me. You went into academic medicine because you had a passion for teaching medical students, residents, fellows. You really remember when you were a trainee and you really want to build on that and, and provide a better education for your trainees than you had. Not that it was bad, but you always want to get better. You really want those trainees to remember the reason they went into medicine in the first place, the reason they went on this endeavor to go to medical school, um, you know, to keep this passion for um, the patient and for medicine alive. Um, I think that this teamwork and communication 
teaching is really important to that. And learning, having our trainees learn how to work in teams can actually help keep this joy of practice alive. Um, a couple of us were invited to go to the ABIM forum recently and talk about keeping the joy and practice alive. And actually, it was on the topic of keeping it alive for trainees. And the speaker before me was one of our colleagues in the department at UCSF in the Department of Medicine, who was a recent graduate. And he talked about his perspective on keeping joy um, and practice alive for the residents. And he shared a story that was pretty impactful to me. I consider him one of our star um, residents. He actually trained at the San Francisco VA, so I know him very well. And he mentioned to me that at one point in his training, he was so burned out that when his pager went off, all he could think about that the patient was the enemy. I imagine we've all been there someday. Um, hopefully not today, but, but we have been there at one point in our lives. And I would like to say that I think this teamwork um, training is actually critically important to keeping that joy in practice alive. I think we need to teach our trainees how to fully engage the team. And by fully engaging the team, they can actually truly have a team to share the work, share the burden. You know, I can't tell you the number of times when I have these complicated patients that are homeless and, you know, have, you know, tuberculosis and need home care. There's no way you can do it all, and you're, you, it stresses you out. But when you have a team who can share that burden with you, don't worry. Let, let me see if I can, the social worker says, let me see if I can call him, see if we can get him a place to stay. Or the nurse says, you know, I've got home care, and we've actually got him a respite bed, and I'm going to get a home visitor. You know, these are just, like, amazing things to make you feel like, wow, I can actually do this. I, it, it helps me keep the joy in practice. So I would say that we need to, to really focus on that as well. I would like to end by saying that, you know, there are a lot of things that have changed in the last 25 years. Um, I've changed. I've learned a lot, as you can tell from the talk. <laughs> um, a lot of things have changed in cardiology, certainly in the treatment of antiarrhythmics. No longer um, are the telemetry, telemetry so bad, so you actually have, we have better telemetry now. Now we have new treatments for antiarrhythmics, so we don't have to give Mrs. M fleconide, um, but, and we also have procedures where we maybe don't even have to do it at all. <laughs> but one thing hasn't changed, and that is the critical need. If it's not the fleconide or the EKG changes, it's going to be something else. And the critical need is that we still, on a day-to-day -day basis, need to be doing these checkbacks that I was talking about. So I would hope that you would humor me in the, in the memory of Mrs. M to get to do a redo. Mrs. Bacuber, are you the nurse taking care of Mrs. M? I am. Uh, yes, I am. Well, I'm the third year resident admitting her, and I would like to talk to you about monitoring her for EKG changes, because you know I'm starting fleconide. You remember, she's a person who has systolic heart failure, mitral valve regurgitation. We need, we've been unsuccessful in controlling her rhythm, and I need to start her on fleconide. But remember that in-service where there's a lot of EKG changes that can result in fatal arrhythmia, so I, we really need to monitor her closely. I would like for you to actually do a 12-lead EKG every hour for the next four hours. I'd like you to monitor the QRS complex and the corrected QT interval. If there are changes such as greater than 150% in the QRS complex, or an increase in the um, corrected QT by 520 milliseconds, I want you to stop the drip, and I want you to page me immediately. OK, sounds good. I would like for you to repeat the, back the plan for me. <laughs> I want to make sure that I was clear. OK, so you want me to check an EKG every hour and then page your intern. No, actually, I'm, I'm really concerned. Very specifically, I would like an EKG 12 lead every hour. I want you to look at the QRS and the QT interval. Increases in QRS interval greater than 150%. QT interval greater than 500, 520 milliseconds. You need to stop the drip and page me immediately. Me, not the intern. Hmm. OK, I think I've got it. So you want me to monitor a 12 lead EKG every hour 
And if the QRS increases by greater than 150% or the QTC is greater than 520, I should page you immediately and not the intern. That is correct. All right. I'd like to thank you on behalf of Mrs. M.